So this is the master slide of all slides. All slides derive from this one. This is all you need to know. So we'll move on from that. Um, <laughs> so we'll come back to that. So uh, for those of you, uh, so uh, the last two weekends, uh, the CEO mastermind doctors uh, were with me in Phoenix. Uh, and we're going over a, sep a different set of metrics, right? So they're learning how to run an enterprise and how to run multiple practices, how to do multiple ownership, how to find the money, how to look at real estate, how to look at, at investing in dentistry. So David Phelps is here. He helps dentists invest in real estate. I help dentists invest in dentistry. And so we've got a separate formula for that that, uh, that we went over in detail. And really, it's how to, how to increase enterprise value, how to maximize enterprise value. And really, when you're working on that end of it, the wealth creation is about seven times faster than with a, a, an individual practice. So we're going to spend a lot of time on this one slide, uh, you know, probably even until the break on this one slide. Uh, because there's so much information on it. So I'll have to give some credit to, um, to Dental Intel because some of the stuff on this slide is theirs uh, and some of it's mine. It's a mixed slide, but it really is the master slide. So one of the things that we help practices do is focus on profits, right? But I want to, re to remind everybody that that is denominated in dollars. And if your focus is on dollars, you're going to have a problem because your team can sense it, your patients can sense it. It's not about dollars. It's about doing the right thing for patients at the right time every time, being consistent at doing the right things for patients, giving patients the option to get the highest level of care. Okay? So we are going to talk about this a lot today, but you'll, as you'll see as we go through it, it really is only about how do we provide that higher level of care for patients? How do we do it consistently? How do we have the entire team do it? How do we offer our patients the, the finest? You mentioned that who knew patients would accept fluoride even though insurance didn't, right? There's a lot of things that patients will accept even though insurance doesn't cover it very well. We just need to be good at helping them understand what it is and how they would benefit from it. So this formula, which is, uh, which is from Dental Intel, uh, is visits times production per visit times collection percentage. And we're going to have some funky things because of the grill here. So, uh, but isn't this cool? <laughs> I feel so cool. It's a stage. It's lights. It's, wow, this is, a, this is a way cooler setup than I am. Uh, minus overhead equals profits. Okay, pretty simple formula, right? Five boxes, and that's really all you need to know. <laughs> but how do we affect each one of those numbers? And what are the things that we should work on first? So I've made a list of the top things to improve each of those numbers. And we're going to walk through that list, uh, and then we're going we're to talk a little bit on how to change it, and then we'll talk in more detail later. So if I'm going to increase visits, the very first thing I'm going to work on is call answering and conversion. Okay, so we know that only about 60% of the incoming calls to practices get answered. We know that 100% of practices are unaware of how many calls they're losing. Right? It's universal. Nobody understands how many calls they're losing. So we think that because we don't hear the phone ringing that we're not getting calls, but maybe somebody's on the calls. Maybe all the lines are full, right? Well, they'll, send, they'll leave a message on voicemail. No, they won't. They won't. Do, we, do you leave messages on voicemail? No. When you call business? No, nobody does, right? So call answering and conversion is, is a key thing because there's so much leverage on this one item. All right, so 60% of calls don't get answered. Remember, one in 10 calls is a new patient, right? So those of you who want more new patients, this is a very, very quick, easy, free way to get them, is to be able to answer all your calls. Some of you may have been in San Antonio, 
um, when when we actually with our uh, with our our uh, partners breakaway, they actually called your offices to see how well the phones were being answered. And remember, one practice uh, had about 90% of their calls being answered, but they had a secondary service that was answering them. They couldn't have hit that number in their own location with their own people, right? Because call volume is not static. It's not, you know, the call volume doesn't go like this throughout the day, throughout the week, right? We've got a big sweep up on Monday. We got a sweep usually in the middle of the week, and then it trails off. And in those peak times, we're missing lots of calls, and we don't even know it. So we know that, it, at, that when we were at that meeting, uh, among this group here, the top one was 90%, but they had help. The bottom one, does anybody remember? How, what percentage of the calls was the bottom one ca capturing? 100% missed. They called them, I don't remember, the, I, th I think they called them 12 times in over two weeks during normal business hours, and they didn't get a person a single time they tried to call. I mean, that's incredible. Do you think they might be missing some new patients? Okay. So getting the calls answered is only half the battle, right? The other half of the battle is getting them converted to an appointment. Uh, raise your hand if you regularly listen to the calls that come into your office. Okay. Yeah, you guys are the ones with the shake. <laughs> yeah, you got that upset stomach feeling. No, it, you really should have a mechanism, and I'll show you one way to do it. You should have a mechanism of listening to the calls uh, because uh, you, you'll be surprised what you hear. So um, Heather, oh, the other dental celebrity I didn't introduce is Heather Driscoll back here. Heather Driscoll, say hi. Very good. Uh, so Heather and I uh, are partners in some practices, and we... Um, uh, so we, we have been going through getting all of the business processes in place. We just, we just acquired this January 1st and we've been getting kind of some team things taken care of and getting some systems into place and now we're up to phones. And so I listened to some of the phone calls and I'll play some of them for you later uh, in, in our offices. And uh, you know, I, I, I knew they probably weren't great but I was really surprised how much room we have to grow and, oppor and, uh, and opportunity, and probably most practices do. So the ability to convert a call to an appointment doesn't happen automatically, okay? So data from Breakaway on practices that they listen to the calls to, data from Breakaway suggests only about a ha half get converted to an appointment. And again, we'll listen to some, and you'll see very clearly why they didn't convert to an appointment. Although when you're a team member and you're doing what you normally do, you're kind of in that unconscious mode, you just do what you do, and they tell you they're going to call, check their schedule and call back. When they tell you that, they're telling you, they're telling you I'm not going to come to your office, right? You blew something in that call. Um, I, on a recent interview with um, uh, John Christensen of Chrisad, so for those of you who don't know, we have a, we have a, a podcast called the Double Your Production Podcast um, that Wendy and I do, and, and we talk to each other about topics. We interview industry experts, and, um, and there's two companies, three companies that I know of that really understand the dental consumer, right, that spend a lot of time. Um, we're preparing some ice for you all. <laughs> Uh, that really understand the dental consumer. Um, and one of them is 1-800-DENTIST, right? Because they, they are a direct-to-consumer company. They have to understand the psychology of the consumer to, in order to get their phones to ring. And then if their phones ring and they don't have an impact on the success of a practice, practices will no longer pay them, right? So they, they have to understand how to connect all the dots, right? So they do a wonderful job of, of consumer research. And uh, another company that does is Chrisad. So Chrisad actually hires the MBA students at, the univers uh, at Northwestern University in Chicago, and they do their consumer research. So one of the things that they identified when they, uh, so they, they listen to calls, they score call calls, and one of the things that they noticed is if the word insurance is used in a telephone call, you have a 30% less chance of appointing that patient. 
30%. So you want to increase your new patients by 30%, eliminate that word from your, from your calls. Okay? Now I can see, don't throw anything at me. <laughs> I, know, I know that that creates a different set of complexity, right? Because now you have to deal with all those insurance issues live with the patient right there, right? If you have the information ahead of time, well, you can gather the data and you kind of know. Now, now you're doing it live, which is definitely more challenging, but you're doing it with more patients. And those patients, how much did you pay for those extra patients? Zero. So one of the things that I've observed in dentistry over the years is that dentists have become more comfortable trying to figure out a way that we can get more new patients by writing a check. Right? I'll just write a bigger and bigger check to get more new patients. However, there's tons of free new patients that you're missing right now. And so I want to let everybody know that writing a check is maybe not the answer. A practice that we work with uh, in, uh, in New York City, um, they, they had a very high spend on marketing and I couldn't and uh, they weren't tracking it very well. So first of all, we got them to track where, where they were spending their money and where they were getting their new patients. Uh, and it was really clear. There was a few things that worked really well. So they cut their marketing budget in half and their new patient numbers did not budge. Okay? So you know what they did again? Now, I wasn't brave enough to tell them to do this, but they cut it in half again and their new patient numbers still didn't budge. All right? So the reason they were able to do that is they fixed this. So they have in their system an internal call center and they have really good people on their phone. And an internal call center just means that it's not in the office, right? It's in this case, it's across the hall from the office. And all they do is answer phones, and all they focus on is that. Now, in a big call, big call centers are very, very hard to manage. Very hard to manage. I know because our company had one. Or had, the company I was with has one, and they're very, very difficult to manage because the 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 amount of knowledge they have to have to be good is very great. Yet their the churn in that job is very high. So people don't stay in a call center job very long on average, right? And so you have a lot of churn of people, but they have to learn a lot before they're effective. And so it's a very, very tough, 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 tough business. But they mastered it. They got super friendly people on the phone. They got people of all, you know, New York is a very international city. So they had people who spoke a variety of languages that were on the phone. They had people on call to answer the, to be able to help with languages that those people in the call center didn't speak, right? So they cut it in half and then they cut it in half again. So they're spending a, a l less than 2% of their revenue on marketing, which is super low. And it has not affected their new patient numbers because they fixed this. Okay. Next one, reappointment. We know that reappointment of patients is the, of all the numbers we can measure in dentistry, this is the most highly correlated with profitability. Reappointment. Now the problem with reappointment and why, so I've ranked these in the order in which I would work on them, okay? So the reason why I, w so this one is the, the most correlated with profitability. I mean, you increase this, profitability goes up proportionally, okay? The reason why I put call answering and conversion first is how long does it take for that to have an effect? If you fix that, when is the effect? Immediately, right? Reappointment, what's, where's the effect? Six months, three, mo three to six months down the road. Right? So that's why I put call answering first. So reappointment. One of the things that should be in every single morning huddle is who left yesterday without an appointment. Okay? Um, 
we know uh, with dental intel and, and following the practices that they work with, we know that if we improve this number by 10%, your practice will double in three years. Now, most of you don't have enough capacity to double. So if you improve this number, you'll run out of space. You'll run out of ops, you'll run out of people, you'll run out of phone lines, okay? So this is a really critical one to improve the most critical one to improve for, for long-term success. So I can tell you in 15 minutes how to fix this. Would anyone like to hear about it or should we go on to the next point? <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. First thing, there's just a few rules, a handful of rules, and, and they are simple to say, they are a little more challenging to do well. Okay, so rule number one, is one person is responsible for reappointing for every type of appointment. Okay, I don't care who it is, but one person's responsible. So a hygiene patient reappointed in hygiene, who is responsible for that? In most offices, it's the hygienist, right? Most hygienists prefer that. They prefer to control their schedule. They're rugged individualists. They wanna master their time, right? So, so you see that is the hygienist, okay? A patient leaving a restorative appointment and needing another restorative appointment, who's responsible for that? In most offices, it's an assistant, right? Not everyone, but for most. That's what I prefer because the assistant knows how much time is gonna be needed, knows what's going on in the rest of the schedule. And I think assistants schedule very, very effectively because they understand really well that the doctor can't be in two places at one time. So, okay, so someone leaving a restorative room and they don't have a hygiene appointment. Who's responsible for that? I can tell you in most offices, no one, right? And this is where we lose a bunch, okay? So in most offices, the assistant is responsible for that. Why one person responsible? Why not two? The fastest way to starve a horse is to put two people in charge of feeding it, right? One thinks the other one did it, a horse gets skinny, okay? So one person is responsible. So, the, the, so this is the most common place where we're missing is someone leaving a restorative appointment, don't, don't have a hygiene appointment, okay? So the assistant needs to be responsible for that. The last one, the last rule on the one person responsible for scheduling. For new patients, new patients should be rescheduled in hygiene prior, prior to the doctor exam. All right, that patient is making a commitment to come back psychologically. They think about the treatment that's gonna be recommended differently because they've already committed to come back. And I can tell you, and we'll look at some numbers because we're gonna pull up some dental intel, and we're gonna look at some numbers and you'll see this is a very common missed thing that the new patient uh, maybe decides not to move forward with treatment right now, right? And if they don't decide to move forward with treatment right now, they were never reappointed. And so, because we thought we would do it the next time and never happens and the patient is out blowing in the wind, okay? So that's kind of rule number one is that um, that we have one person responsible. Okay, rule number two is that every morning in the morning huddle, we are identifying the people who were missed. And are, is there gonna be people missed? Absolutely, there's gonna be people missed. Um, and so, because things get crazy sometimes. And so, if there's things, if there's people missed, we need a mechanism of get them back on the schedule. Okay, here's the rule. Whoever was responsible to reappoint them is the person responsible for getting them back on the book. Okay, so if hygiene missed one, the hygiene has to get on the phone and get them back on the book. This is human nature, right? If we have to clean up our own messes, we make less messes. Okay. Rule uh, number three is if a patient refuses to reappoint, it's documented in their clinical chart. So every morning at the morning huddle, 
whoever is leading the morning huddle is going to identify the reappointment rate from the day before and they are going to verbally recognize the one that's doing the best. Okay? We're going to recognize the one that's doing best. Betsy, great job yesterday. You were the top reappointer. Way to go. We can create more change in our organizations by putting attention and focus on the people that are doing things the best. Yet our human nature is that we tend to focus on people that are doing the worst, right? So flip that the other way and you'll see that change. If you, move, if you follow those simple rules, your reappointment rate will go up 10%. Easy. Easy. And if your reappointment rate goes up 10%, what, 18 months from now, you don't, you don't have enough room. You're full. You can't take any more new patients. You don't want any more new patients. You, can't, you, you don't have rooms for the ones that you already have. And at that point, that's a fun place to be, isn't it? Because at that point, well, now we can decide, do we want to grow? Do we want to have, do we want to expand our hours, which is the first way you grow? And if we expand, if we've already expanded our hours, well, maybe now we want a second location. Awesome. Or maybe we want to go the other direction. Maybe we want to say, well, we've got more patients than we can take care of. Let's take the, the worst paying, the nastiest, the most uncooperative insurance company and tell them to go stuff it. <laughs> right? So that's the other option. All right, reappointment, super important. Next one, case acceptance. So this is at the very top, the very top of the correlation between profitability and this number, right? Reappointment's number one, this is number two. And when I talk about case acceptance, I'm talking about the, ex the patient accepting something, okay? That's the number to measure. And I'll be showing you how to, measure, how, how to measure all these things in a little bit. And I'll be showing you how to go through the process of change if we're wanting to improve one. So at this point, we're just kind of laying out the numbers and we'll, we'll talk more about the process as we go along. I did go into the reappointment process more than I will the rest because it's so easy and it's so, it, it, it's so critical. So case acceptance is we're getting them to improve something. Um, next one, teamwork column. Okay, formerly known as the ghost column, right? The ghost column has a connotation to it. Teamwork column is a better name, isn't it? Because it doesn't work unless you have great teamwork. And for those of you who, who aren't familiar with the teamwork column, um, most, one, of the, one of the number one problems that practices have is canceled and failed appointments, right? It's universal. When we poll uh, practices and say their highest concerns, um, one of them is uh, patient flow, new patient, not enough new patients. Number two is PPO th things, so they have a cash flow issue. Uh, and this one is next, okay? Uh, we work with a, a big uh, group, and that in, in that big group, their, their standard process is a 40-minute hygiene appointment, which is not what I recommend or Wendy recommends, but it's, that is their process. Um, so they should be seeing 10 patients, at least 10 patients a day. If you do the, you know, the math, 10 patients, hour pa uh, or 40 minutes per patient, eight-hour day, 10. Okay. They're not seeing 10 new patients or 10 hygiene patients per hygienist per day. They're seeing 5.6. Almost half of their hygiene days are empty, even though they start at the beginning of the day full. Okay? So that is a huge, huge cancel and fail problem. Most of the practices in here are not at that level, but most of you, have, most of you would su suggest that this is a problem for you. Ghost column is how we solve that. And so how this works is we go through our pattern of patient reminders. So we are reappointing the patient at the time of their last visit, right? We're having them fill out a postcard to themselves with the t date and time of their appointment, of their next appointment, right? We're saving those all up and then we're sending them out about two weeks before their appointment. That is the most effective thing that, that I know of. 
then we have some type of electronic reminder system, right? That would send them a text or an email or an automated voicemail or even a, a real person calling. All of these contacts are designed to, are, are asking that patient to call and confirm their appointment, okay? So we've contacted them maybe two or three times to confirm their appointment. Do they confirm their appointment? Some do, some don't, okay? The teamwork column is picking, and this is where to start anyway, is picking one patient in the morning and one patient in the afternoon who is unconfirmed that you are pretty sure is not showing up. And you are moving them from a place where there is a uh, column and a hygienist and you are moving them to a place. It's a happy place in the cloud. There is no room, there's no hygienist. It's just a happy place out there, okay? And then you are filling the place where they were with a room and a hygienist with a confirmed patient, okay? So guess what? Almost all the time, that one doesn't show up. Every once in a while it does, and then we gotta scramble. We'll talk about that later. But, yes? Two days, yep. And so when I'm reappointing, I'm reappointing for six months out plus two weeks. Because insurance companies usually have a six week kind of th or six month kind of deal if you're short of six months they're not going to pay you if you're one day short of six months they're not going to pay you right and so since there's a six month kind of deal you we got two weeks and so now we know anybody who's scheduled in the next two weeks we can call and move them forward right hey mrs jones i see you've got an appointment next tuesday but we've got an opening today would today work for you that's how you fill those with confirmed appointments Okay. Next one is reactivation. And uh, Wendy's going to talk about all the R's because she's going to be a pirate today. And the last one on my list is new patients. So when most people come to TTI for solutions to some of their practice problems, most of them will tell us that this is their number one problem, that they need more new patients. Yet when we do the analysis, we find that, that nearly all of them are having problems serving the patients they already have, right? Are new patients easy? No, they're not easy, right? So we tell them, come 10 minutes before your appointment so you can fill out your paperwork. Do they come 10 minutes before? No, they come either a half an hour before and a half hour after. And they just, it, it makes no sense when they come, right? <laughs> so then we've got to enter all their information in the computer. Now we've got to figure out what their insurance is going to do, right? Now we have to take an in-depth health history. Now we've got to get that, gather all the data. Now we have to build relationship. Now the doctor's got to build relationship. It takes a longer exam. Now you're doing a more comprehensive exam. It takes longer, right? And now you're doing case presentation for someone who you haven't had much time to build trust with, right? So we go through all of this work, and then only a third of them buy anything. And that's the number. Only a third of them buy anything. Yes, Ian? Correct. It's, uh, it doesn't matter. It's both, yeah. It's both, so that number, that's, that's a dental number, a dental intel number, and it's just simply measuring what was diagnosed in a hygiene chair and what was done. It, it's it's uh, agnostic as to whether it's a new patient or a hygiene patient. Okay, so, um, so these new patients are a lot of work and not many of them buy something, all right? So it's, isn't it smarter to really focus on the ones you've already got and keeping them in? There's a practice very close to where we are right now that when we started working with them, they were getting 435 new patients a month. Should be enough, right? Okay, big office, four docs, 16, 17 ops, so it was a big office, but still that's a lot of new patients. And at that rate, they should be adding a hygienist every 13 days, 14 days, or something like that. 
And so, and were they? No, they weren't. And so they were having throughput. <laughs> so they were doing all this work on this new patient, but they weren't, weren't retaining, right? So they're getting 435 in, but they were losing 435 on the other side. And so they were spending a lot because this is an extremely competitive dental market in, in Salt Lake. This is one of the toughest cities in the entire United States. Um, and so they were paying for and doing all the work on new patients and then they weren't retaining. So guess where their profitability was? There wasn't any, right? Even though big practice, huge top, top line, no bottom line. So new patients in most practices uh, is not going to help. Let's see if my spotlight works. It is not gonna help that number much. Now, if you're severely deficient, maybe. But most of the time, profitability comes from the work patients you already have. Okay, and the last one is to reduce broken appointments, and that is doing all the things that Wendy's gonna talk about this afternoon. Okay, production per visit. Number one way to improve that is same-day dentistry. Same-day dentistry is Dentistry done that wasn't on the, on the book at the beginning of the day. How many of you have had a schedule that looks at the end of the day like it did at the beginning? How many of you have ever gone through a day where everything ended up in your entire career? How many of you ever had a day that, that did that, right? So Heather always says, the schedule is only a suggestion. It'll never end up that way. So don't get too tied into it. And offer patients the opportunity to do any treatment that you recommend that day. And if they want to do it that day, figure out if you can. And if you can, do. If you can't, you don't. But if you can, do. In many practices, and we'll sh I'll show you how to measure this, in many practices, this can be 30 to 40% of their production and it's just serving their current patient base at a higher level because patients love the convenience of being able to get it done today. So when you offer to do it today, case acceptance goes up. Even if you can't do it today and you offer it today, case acceptance goes up, right? Because they've committed mentally to doing it when they say, yeah, I'll do it today. They've committed mentally. A little switch has turned in their brains, right? Next, increase fees. Um, I hear this statement a lot. We can't increase our fees or it doesn't do any good to increase our fees because insurance companies aren't gonna pay anymore. They're only gonna pay us what they pay us. I've heard this over and over and over again. Um, and I understand the logic of that statement it may not affect insurance payments. You don't know that it won't though. That's a guess. You don't know that it won't. So we worked with the practice that whose fee schedule was low and it was low for a variety of reasons. So we work with one practice in this city and we work with another practice in this city. So we can compare and in one practice, their fees were low. They, they had a convoluted um, compensation system, which, had, which made it not wise. They're, they're paying their providers on production, not on collections. And so if they increased their fees, it made for more production, which means they had to pay more for their providers, but they weren't necessarily collecting anymore, or not, they didn't think they were gonna collect anymore. So they just let their fees go stagnant for many years. Okay, so now their fees are really lower. So now they're saying, well, I don't wanna raise the fees because the insurance companies aren't, but we can see what the insurance companies are paying in other practices. And they're paying more than this company is charging, but this company doesn't know it, right? So when you say the insurance company won't pay anymore, you don't know, it's a guess, you don't know. You think your fee schedule is the same as somebody else's fee schedule, it's not. What they pay provider A is not the same as what they pay provider B. What they pay provider B isn't even, isn't even consistent from day to day, week to week. We all know that. 
we all go to enter the payment and you're like, what? what that doesn't make sense. So now we change our fee schedule and then the next one comes and it's less and now we change the fee schedule back. They're not, as, they're not that consistent, okay? So, so first of all, you don't know that you won't be paid more by insurance companies if you raise your fees. That's a guess, right? It's a fear, actually. It's more of a fear than a guess. Second thing is, what percentage of your patients or what percentage of your revenue comes from insurance companies? Right? I'll show you how to find out so that you can tell whether increase, right? Because you have patients that don't, don't have insurance and they're paying your full fee. And if you raise your fees, they'll be paying your full fee, right? So I think that this is, I don't think that patients are, are insensitive to fee changes, but I don't think that's a major driver of the relationship. Now, if you make a huge shift and a sudden shift and a shift in a way patients are gonna be able to tell, it may be, that may affect patient retention. But if you do it smartly and wisely and judiciously, it won't. Next one, diagnose needed treatment. Um, I, I've had the opportunity to speak for a lot of large audiences this summer, um, you know, with 350 people in the room. And so we do a little exercise with these people and we, sh we put up some slides and they all write down what their treatment plan would be. And then we go through what are some logical things. Raise your hand if you're gonna do this. Raise your hand if you're gonna do this, right? And so as we do this on relatively simple cases that are relatively obvious, we see this huge range in what is diagnosed and treatment planned, right? And that huge range is what diagnostic assertiveness. So if we brought a patient in here and put them in the middle of the room and all of you did a diagnosis on them, would we have one treatment plan? No, we'd have a bunch, wouldn't we? So some of them include the most treatment, some of them include the lowest amount of treatment, and that range is a range in diagnostic assertiveness. This isn't a judgment. This, is, this isn't good or this isn't good. It's not a judgment. It's just an observation, right? So, but I have seen people that I've gone into practices and seen watch. We're gonna watch that. I wonder about watches a little bit um, because there's something there and you're gonna watch it. Which dental disease problem gets better over time? <laughs> None of them do, right? They all get worse. And my fear with the watches is we can't tell how quickly they're gonna get worse, right? So have you ever had this happen? Where a regular patient came in, regular visit, had regular bite wings. You look at the bite wings and there's an area of decay that's pretty, that's, that's you know, relatively large. And you think, well, how'd that get there? And you look back at the pre bite wings previous and it doesn't look like much, right? We can't tell how fast it's gonna get bad. How about periodontal disease? Can we tell how fast that's gonna get bad? Boy, I'll tell you, the research is scary because you really can't. It can go super fast, right? It's a disease of bursts and remissions, but if we have a very long burst, it can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. You know, and people that are immunocompromised is where you usually see that, where they'll have a tremendous amount of damage in a short period of time. So if it's there, do it. Next one to increase production per visit is increased treatment acceptance. Treatment acceptance and case acceptance, a little bit different. So treatment acceptance is, you told them they needed $1,000 worth of care. What percentage of that $1,000 did they accept and decide to move forward with? Is it $100 of that 1,000 or is it 500 of that 1,000? Makes a big impact on your production per visit. Next one, expand treatment procedures. Okay, um, most dentists, um, if they're doing bread and, bread and butter dentistry, you know, they start to top out at, you know, 800, 900, maybe $1,000 an hour. But there are other procedures that are much more productive than that. 
right? So if you're able to do those procedures, your, pro your productivity per visit will go up, your productivity per hour will go up. So I just looked at some data from a doctor who does not do surgery, does not do endo, and doesn't do dentures. And he was $2,000 an hour, but that's very unusual. Next one, reduce PPO dependency, if that's your strategy. That will drive up production per visit. Now, it may drive down visits, though, so danger. You have to make sure that you are over-demanded if you're going to use this strategy, that you've got more people that want to come in than you can see. And then you're going to do this very judiciously. You're going to take that one, the very worst one, low number of patients that have it, big pain in the ass factor, excuse my French, for the, uh, for the, from the insurance company. That's the one you're going to drop. All right. Now collection percentage. We're on the crack here of the screen, so this will be fun. Okay. Improving collection percentage. Firm financial arrangements. Patients know what their portion's going to be, and they know how they're going to pay it before they make their appointment. Firm financial arrangements also affects visits. Okay? Because it affects broken appointments. Patients who make an appointment and aren't committed to pay for it, don't know what's going to pay for it, they're anxious about what's going to cost, they don't know what's going to cost, those are patients that are more likely to break an appointment. Claims in clean. So most of you are filing claims electronically. And when you file things electronically, it goes to some electronic clearinghouse. And the clearinghouse then sends it on to the insurance company. You can manage those claims in the clearinghouse. They get stuck there if the claims aren't clean. And by clean, meaning they have all the information an insurance company may want to have for that procedure. So the claims go in clean and the clearinghouse is empty. One of the practices that we acquired had a clearinghouse that had hundreds of claims in it going back 18 months. No one was ever looking to make sure they came out of there. Next, collection percentage. Contacting insurance companies on day 15. Did you get our claim? When can we expect payment? If you haven't gotten it by day 15, there may be a problem. So let's find out at day 15 rather than day 90, which is what an awful lot of practices do. They start focusing at 90 days out. That's too late to have an impact. Next one, send statements. <laughs> that sounds funny, but uh, at the company that I was with before, when we'd noticed that there was a collection problem in an office, we'd go and we'd check their practice management software to see when the last time they ran statements. And sometimes it had been two or three months. They just forgot. That's a biggie. All right. And the next is to have some collection process, right? So what we recommend is the day insurance company pays, if there is a balance, we're sending them a statement that day for the remainder. Once a month, they haven't had a statement during the month, they're getting another one. They're getting one. Right? We're sending three statements. At the end of three statements, we are beginning our collection process. Our collection process is designed to look as though it's coming from another company and you actually have another company that will do this for you. One company that we worked with that we had very good results with was a company called TransUnion. So TransUnion does this. Transworld, thank you, Transworld. And so we send them uh, three letters in the collection process. If they have not paid after those three letters, we write off the balance, we put on their chart that they owe us the money, but we don't consider it collectible. We don't go after them anymore. We don't take them to court. We don't, right? So we don't, we don't hire someone to chase them. The reason we don't 
hire someone to chase them and we don't take them to court and we don't do all that stuff is that at the end of the day when you look at all the people that you do that amount of work to get the money you you're only collecting you know maybe 40 percent and if you have a company doing that for you you're getting maybe only 20 percent but you're ticking off an awful lot of people who think you're rich and think you're greedy and you're just creating an awful lot of bad will in your community that I don't think is worth it. That's my philosophy. So I make sure, and this should be so very few if you do this right, right? There's going to be some. But of those few, how many of them ran into something unexpected? How many of them had something happen in their life that set them upside down? and now you're chasing after them and they're already upside down, right? So that's what we do. I think of it as being a little compassionate. So that which is not collected after the letters, we, we write off. If they come back in, um, we'll attempt to collect it. So we don't spank patients if they're in that spot. If they come back in, we don't say, oh no, you've got to pay this before we're going to make an appointment. We don't do that. We welcome them back in, and then we make financial arrangements when they're there. A whole lot easier face-to-face, -face, right? Smiling, saying, what would be comfortable to you to clear up this old, old balance? What payment would be good? Yeah, Dr. Ruta? Okay, so the question is, how do you handle someone that, that, that declares bankruptcy and wants to come back? I really, I'm so excited to have you back in the practice. Thanks so much for coming back. Yep. So does anybody want to go into bankruptcy, right? Nobody wants to go into bankruptcy. They're forced into bankruptcy from circumstances, sometimes from poor judgment, but sometimes not, right? You don't know. You don't know their situation. So I don't want to, I don't want to judge them. I've known super smart people who later became super successful, wonderful people that went through a bankruptcy. There's probably people in this room that have gone through a bankruptcy, right? So I don't judge them. And if they want to come back, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to make firm financial arrangements. And I'm going to, yep, I'm going to make firm, I'm going to make the same financial arrangements with them that I would anybody else. I'm going to treat them just as if that bankruptcy didn't happen. They didn't want to end up there. So let's not spank them. They've already been spanked. Believe me, if you have been through bankruptcy, you have been spanked a lot. Yes. So How do you want to handle that? I, 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 my opinion is I wouldn't treat them any differently than anybody else. Exactly. I would treat them exactly like everybody else. Don't, don't and so if that is your process to do pre-Ds, um, then, uh, which I'm not a fan of, but if that's your process and you do it with everybody, I would do it with them. Otherwise, I would not treat them any differently. So to suggest that someone goes through, I, I'm more concerned about people who just never paid their bill than I am people who went through bankruptcy. People who went through bankruptcy, they didn't want to go through bankruptcy, right? Something happened. Most commonly, what? What happened? They had, got, they had a health problem, they lost their job, their medical bills got so high they were never ever going to be able to catch up and it was their only option. That could happen to anybody in this room, right? So I, I, I just, I think that we, you know, if we eliminate the judgment of people and just 
just treat them like everybody else have firm financial arrangements are you going to lose some sure are some people not going to pay you sure are there some people who are just not trustworthy sure but not that many come on most of the people are are trustworthy most of the time when you don't get paid it was because something happened okay overhead percentage master the profit and loss statement and we're going to talk about profit and loss statements later today um, that is a financial statement that allows you to understand what income is coming in what revenue is coming in and what expenses are going out and we're going to give you some benchmark numbers of the things to to look for on that and if you do all those things you will have done the most important things that you can do in order to drive profitability now when you drive profitability and this number goes up there's a lot of good things that happen right because as you all know you know we suggest you have a system of sharing that with the entire team so the entire team er earns more doesn't make more they earn more right so that's good um, the patients are served at a higher level that's good right you have team members that are making more than they can make somewhere else is your team retention better you bet and if your team retention better is your patient retention better yes right so a lot of good things now we've got money to invest back in the practice too when we have this number right so now we can make sure that we have the highest technology we can make sure that we keep everything updated we have money to invest in additional ops or we have additional money to invest in so when this number goes up all kinds of good things happen when this number goes up now we can support our community and the charities that we care for at a higher level right so a lot of good things happen when that number goes up all right, so with that, let's go ahead and take a break.